afternoon and welcome to the Hudson Institute. My name is Sushka Petrovic and I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. I will be your host today during this special event on intellectual property rights and antitrust law. The interplay between intellectual property and antitrust has been for a long time at the center of the policy debate. In the past, there was a concern that there is a tension between the two bodies of law. On the one hand, IP rights were perceived as granting temporary monopolies to their owners. On the other hand, antitrust law was seen as the body of law that is concerned with monopolies. So there was a conception that there is somehow a natural contradiction between the two bodies of law. Of course, with time, this, um, this concerns have changed. There is now a general recognition that both antitrust and IP aim at the same goal. They seek to promote innovation at the benefit of consumers. With time, courts and antitrust agencies have also provided important guidance for the role that antitrust has in scrutinizing licensing practices related to patents and IP more generally. For example, there is a general agreement that antitrust U.S. antitrust law should play a limited role in policing royalties for a license to IP rights. There seems to be also general consensus that the refusal to license an IP right, even if directed toward a competitor, typically does not raise um, antitrust concerns. But perhaps more importantly, recent academic research has shown the importance that uh, a strong IP system has for competition. It has shown that the strong IP rights foster um, competition in the market. Yet some commentators argued that we, a weaker IP system would be better for competition and consumers. And consequently, they suggest that there might be a need to revise the um, policies that guide the interplay between antitrust and IP. And to, uh, to discuss the merits of those proposals, we have with us today two terrific speakers. We have with us Commissioner Christine Wilson. She was sworn in on September 2018 as a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. She previously served as the FTC Chairman Tim Morris Chief of Staff and as a law clerk in the Bureau of Competition. In between her periods of service at the FTC, Commissioner Wilson has practiced competition and consumer protection law, both at law firms and as an in-house counsel. And we have with us also former commissioner and acting FTC chair, Maureen Olhausen. During her time at the FTC, Commissioner Olhausen directed all FTC competition and consumer protection work with a particular emphasis on privacy and technology issues. She now chairs the antitrust group at Baker Woods. Welcome and thank you for being here. Commissioner Wilson, let me start with you. As just discussed, the interplay between antitrust and IP has been a hotly debated topic for a long time. In the last decades, many issues have been discussed. A resolution have be, has been reached on some and others remain open. So could you talk a little bit about how you see the evolution of the antitrust and IP interplay? And what do you think are the issues over which we have reached consensus? And what are those that in your view need further discussion? First, thank you so much to you and to the Hudson Institute for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to address this topic, which is not just a fascinating one, but also a really important one for economic growth and for consumer welfare. So as you mentioned, uh, we, we have a lot of history in, in terms of the intersection of antitrust and IP. We have come a long way since the 1970s and the DOJ's infamous nine no-nos, um, which many of you will be familiar with. It was a policy governing patent licensing enforcement that condemned certain so-called forbidden practices. Uh, those, those nine no-nos were repudiated in the early 1980s. That was an important step in this evolution of antitrust and IP. And the repudiation was justified because the policy lacked a sound economic foundation for condemning the subject practices. And it also lacked a sufficient appreciation for the incentives for innovation that intellectual property and IP licensing can provide. 
so the DOJ has a history here, but so does the FTC. The FTC has uh, closely examined this intersection. As you mentioned, I had the honor of serving as chief of staff to chairman uh, Tim Muris when we launched the hearings on competition and intellectual property law and policy in the knowledge-based economy. In other words, a set of hearings that looked at this important intersection between antitrust and IP. And when he announced the hearings, he explained a fundamental principle properly understood, both IP law and antitrust law seek to promote innovation and enhance consumer welfare. As you noted, IP law properly applied preserves incentives for innovation. And of course, innovation benefits consumers through the development of new and improved goods and services, and it spurs economic growth. And similarly, antitrust law properly applied promotes innovation and economic growth by combating any competitive arrangements and monopolistic practices that deter vigorous economic activity. The Mirrors Commission also launched some important cases here, including Rambus and Unical. The FTC has also brought enforcement actions that probably failed to strike the right balance. And I believe that Maureen is, uh, is probably going to touch on some of those cases. Uh, and I commend to all of you her dissent in Bosch, Google MMI, and of course, Qualcomm. So the proper policy at bottom has to take a broad view on the appropriate balance between IP and antitrust. And I think generally speaking, um, there's a need to strike a balance between static and dynamic analysis essentially between instant gratification and delayed gratification. Hatch-Waxman in the pharmaceutical arena is a great example of this balance. This act rewards branded manufacturers for incredible innovations, but then provides for robust generic competition after a period of time. Now you, you asked about consensus. And, um, and consensus is important because it leads to consistency and clarity, which in turn spurs investment and innovation. Reaching a consensus in many of these areas is difficult. First, we know that the antitrust IP interplay isn't monolithic. There are many areas that potentially touch both antitrust and IP, and each of those areas has its own unique characteristics. And second, courts, which build off of each other and rely on growing precedent, aren't the only decision makers. The antitrust agencies and other agencies with IP oversight also need to align. And because we operate in a global economy, uh, a US consensus is insufficient. We need a global consensus. Otherwise, we get forum shopping as we increasingly see multinational courts, uh, multinational companies are running to courts in favorable jurisdictions around the world to handle issues at the intersection of IP and antitrust. So there, there have been, as you know, many steps in the evolution between antitrust and IP through courts and antitrust agencies over the last few years. Unfortunately, I fear that not all of the recent developments have moved us toward a consensus, uh, particularly a consensus that strikes that right balance between static and dynamic. Um, and so I think one, one big example is Judge Coe's infamous Qualcomm decision. There were many issues uh, with, with her opinion, and I view as a positive development the Ninth Circuit's rejection of Judge Coe's attempt at, quote, using the antitrust laws to remedy what are essentially contractual disputes between private parties engaged in the pursuit of technological innovation in matters that concern SSO and FRAND obligations. And frankly, speaking of consensus, I hope the Ninth Circuit's decision helps drive a consensus on that issue. Uh, another recent notable, notable milestone is the Second Circuit's holding that protection of trademarks is a valid pro-competitive justification for the agreements at issue in 1-800 contacts. There, the Second Circuit largely embraced the themes that were in, uh, in Commissioner Phillips' dissent. I arrived uh, too late at the commission to take part in issuing the commission decision that was overturned, uh, and I am going to steer clear of discussing in, in more detail uh, given that it's an ongoing litigation, but I think it's a, a notable development. And then, of course, we, you know, we've got a uh, consensus moving both ways in the international arena on patent settlement litigation. I think you see some uh, convergence, but in other areas, you see uh, a, a move away from consensus. So in, in many jurisdictions, uh, there are 
there's an agreement that courts can enjoin infringement of an SCP, but courts around the world are enjoining parties from proceeding in other jurisdictions. And these anti-suit injunctions lead other courts to counter with anti-anti-suit injunctions. And as this process spirals, commentators are concerned that parties will leave the negotiating table early to file a suit in a favorable forum. And so this lack of a consensus, particularly a consensus built on sound economic and legal principles, unfortunately, I believe is going to, uh, to limit investment in innovation. My apologies for the, the long-winded opening. I promise the rest of my answers will be shorter. Thank you. That was, I think, a very nice overview of how the uh, relationship between the antitrust and IP has evolved over time. Uh, Commissioner Olhausen, uh, at the time when you were at the FTC, antitrust enforcement in the context of IP rights was a hotly debated topic. What do you think are the most important advancements that have been achieved in this debate? Uh, thank you, Erska. Thank you for having me and to Hudson uh, for hosting this event. And I'm delighted to be here with uh, Commissioner Wilson to discuss these important topics. One of the, I think, key uh, things that happened while I was at the commission, and you had asked about um, consensus, was the update to the antitrust IP licensing guidelines, uh, which was a bipartisan um, update. It occurred in uh, sort of the period at the end of the um, Obama administration and before the Trump, uh, incoming Trump administration. Uh, but I uh, was on the commission and I, I voted for the um, update to the guidelines. And they showed great continuity and consensus. And they raised several key points that I hope we will continue to have consensus on because I think they're essential. Um, the first is that IP uh, laws grant enforceable property rights and that those have social value. Uh, one of the things that um, had been sort of, I think, in the academy in particular was the idea that, oh, it's just a faith-based view that IP rights actually contribute. Uh, we would still have innovation and everything would, you know, perk along just fine with, without it. And I think one of the things that we're finding is that um, so I did a study of that and found actually that you see more investment in R&D uh, when you have strong IP rights and less when IP rights are diminished. Um, and so to the extent that you want that sort of um, R&D investment and that leads to innovation, it's important to have strong IP rights. But that doesn't play out equally across every industry. And I, I hope we get a better understanding of that view that uh, you can have strong IP rights and that they're very valuable. But if there are entities who feel they want to put their goods or you know, their IP out uh, in the market in, in a less constrained way, I think that's fine too. And in some types of innovation that works better, um, but we can't diminish the role of IP in some, a different model for, for development. Um, secondly, the, guide, the IP licensing guidelines um, observed that antitrust laws generally do not impose liability on a firm for unilateral refusal to assist its competitors. This is such a key issue for antitrust. I think this really goes to the heart also of the Qualcomm decision, where they said, uh, you know, this is, this is fierce competition. This is, you know, um, acceptable that you have IP as you see, as you see fit. Um, I think, you know, one of the glosses that we've seen on that, I thought Chairman Muris um, was one who brought that to make a distinct power by um, essentially um, uh, to a standard setting organization where they, for example, don't reveal that they have IP, right? So the state, we, we in the Unicloud case, they come to the standard and then they kind of pop out at the end and say, aha, we've got the IP and you all have to pay us. And that was the source of that IP holder's market power, uh, was the deception on the standard setting organization. But if you are going into a standard setting organization and the agreement is people are supposed to pay you for that IP, I don't see antitrust playing a role of saying, well, 
but actually, you know, you didn't have a rule on injunctions. There's no, oh, there should have been a rule on it. You know, it's like kind of upsetting the agreements that the um, parties on both sides of the uh, standard setting table ha had agreed to. Um, one of the other things uh, that the IP licensing guidelines set forth is that IP licensing is generally pro-competitive. I think you also saw this in the Qualcomm decision. You know, it is, you want IP holders to feel that they can share their IP with other uh, parties, implementers, and that they will get, uh, you know, the, the rate of return that, that they feel they should get out of that. That, that it's not going to be that the bargain is changed afterwards um, in, in a way that undermines the long-term incentives to create the IP or to put the IP into a standard. As I, I, uh, Commissioner Wilson mentioned dynamic effects, and that's really important. Um, if we start making it um, you know, a very risky proposition, an even riskier proposition for IP holders to allow their IP to be licensed, uh, perhaps they won't license it as freely and that, that could be harmful. Um, another precept in the guidelines is the agencies don't presume that IP and um, for excessive pricing without any, and if an intellectual property right does confer market power, that market power does not by itself offend the antitrust law. I think there's been sort of this inflation, the idea that, well, if you have, you know, really valuable IP right, that that somehow obligates you to share it with others on terms that you didn't agree to, right? Just because, oh, others think they could use it and uh, they could get into the market and they compete, compete more fiercely. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, just because you have that strong IP right, that therefore you are forced to share it or you're forced to share it on the terms in which your competitors want you to share is the terms that you, you agreed to. Um, and then I'll, I'll just stop with the last um, precept from the uh, antitrust and IP licensing guidelines is that the rule of reason governs IP licensing restrictions. So I think those were very key points of consensus, um, bipartisan consensus in the US and I hope uh, we build up. Thank you. Uh, I think both of you have touched upon a very important topic, which are standard essential patents. These are patents that are essential to practice industry standards, such as the 4G and 5G standard. And of course, this topic has been a very important component of the antitrust IP debate. It's also an area where we have reached some consensus, not only within the United States, but also globally. Uh, for example, an issue that was often discussed in the past was whether a holder of standard essential patents should face an antitrust liability for requesting a court to issue an injunction against an infringer. So do you think there is now a general agreement that the mere request for such a remedy should not trigger an antitrust liability? Um, so... Commissioner Wilson uh, mentioned the, um, the Google MMI and, and the Bosch um, cases. Uh, and um, I raised uh, concerns here, I, I dissented on the grounds that um, the, you know, the, at least in the US, the Supreme Court laid out the, um, the factors on which um, an injunction should be granted. Um, the Courts are very well positioned to make these kinds of decisions about whether an injunction should be granted. And I didn't think it was appropriate for the antitrust agencies to essentially tackle um, an IP holder uh, on the courthouse steps and say, oh, you can't even ask the court for an injunction um, because that's an antitrust violation. Uh, that that, you know, um, somehow, if you haven't, promise that you won't seek an injunction because um, they, like in a lot of these standard setting organizations, they had considered and rejected a no injunction rule. And so they, the IP holder had entered the agreement through the, you know, the standard, uh, the agreements as part of the standard setting organization with the understanding that they would be able to get an injunction and to have an antitrust agency say, well, no, you can't. 
and, to, and also based on the presumption that the courts would come out the wrong way, right? That the court would weigh the equities uh, inappropriately, I found a very concerning. I think that um, over time, actually, the, the, um, the initial position of the, oh, you can never get an injunction um, has, I think that if, the, um, if there's an, un um, I, I hope that there's a better understanding that opportunity conduct can happen on either side of the table, that there can be hold out, uh, not just hold up, uh, and that an injunction can be a really key issue. And, and it's a high standard to get it, a post eBay, it's a high standard to get an injunction. So I think there has been um, movement away from, I think, the more um, draconian, you, you know, it's an, it's an antitrust uh, violation if you have a friend and cover accept to try to get an injunction uh, against a licensee who has not been uh, paying paying royalties. Um, so, um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I, I think that there has been greater understanding of the dynamics and consensus, but um, I'm, I'm not sure that will continue. <laughs> Commissioner so, Wilson. Thank you. So, so I, I would just echo what Maureen said. I firmly agree that a mere request for an injunction should not trigger antitrust liability. Um, I think, unfortunately, there is not enough of a consensus around this belief, especially in the international community. Um, the, an interesting case from the European Court of Justice in Huawei VZTE actually takes a, a, a constructive approach. Uh, the ECJ established a safe harbor from antitrust liability for holders of an SEP, and under this approach, the holder of the SEP doesn't violate European antitrust law by requesting an injunction if, prior to bringing the action, the SEP holder alerts the alleged infringer of the infringement by designating the patent and specifying the way in which it's been infringed, and then presents to that infringer a written offer for a license specifying the royalty and the way in which it is to be calculated. Where the infringer continues to use the patent in question and fails to respond diligently to the offer, a request for an injunction will not lead to antitrust liability. Um, I, think, I think this is a constructive approach, and it is an approach that is followed in many jurisdictions around the world, but some courts and agencies go astray when they inject antitrust law into what is at bottom a contract dispute. And I agree with Maureen that these are contract issues and patent issues and should not be uh, antitrust issues. Um, thank you. Another hotly debated topic in the context of uh, essential patents was whether a violation of a commitment to offer a license on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms should be considered an antitrust violation. Uh, what is your opinion on this issue? Do, do we have a con consensus or not really? So, so as you know, this question was uh, central in the Qualcomm case. And as most of you watching also know, my answer in that case was a clear and resounding no. Friend disputes are contract disputes and should not be judged under antitrust rules. Patents grant a patentee the right to exclude others, especially competitors, for the use of the patented technology. And this power to exclude is the reward for the innovation that led to the patent. And it serves to incentivize innovation and disclosure of technology. And there were two key implications to consider in deciding not to find antitrust liability in these situations. First, antitrust policy should not overly diminish the incentive that IP rights create to innovate. Forced sharing, as Maureen described, including in the form of antitrust violations that would strengthen the negotiating position of implementers over innovators may substantially diminish the incentive to innovate in the first place. And the resulting loss of innovation will deprive consumers of countless benefits. So forced sharing is a choice to elevate the static view and instant gratification over a dynamic analysis and delayed gratification that brings greater rewards. And second, if the goal is to encourage licensing and innovation, antitrust laws are not the correct method of determining the relevant rules or calculating royalty rates. 
a contract dispute between sophisticated parties negotiating over IP rights will only become more complicated and consequently less likely to be resolved without a court if antitrust law is forced into the analysis. And so the more we force antitrust law into IP disputes, the more likely companies are to question seemingly legitimate business practices. And in the end, the result will discourage pro-competitive business conduct and mutually beneficial partnerships with competitors. So Erska, I would hope that we have a consensus. I would hope that Judge Coe's decision in Qualcomm is an outlier. And I think it would be unfortunate for consumers and for innovation if that consensus begins to deteriorate. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rollhausen, would you like to add anything? Uh, I, I don't think I could uh, top that. It was such a, a masterful summary of the, of the issues here. So I just completely agree. You know, the, the Qualcomm decision, um, you know, look, I, I dissented when the FTC brought the action. The, the flaws were apparent from the very beginning. And the, um, the Ninth Circuit decision, I think, very much made it clear, you know, what the right, what the right outcome was and for the right reason. And another topic that we have already briefly touched upon is the risk of opportunism. So in the past, antitrust agencies have focused on the risk that the holder of an essential patent would act opportunistically, the so-called risk of patent holdup. With time, however, uh, they have recognized that implementers might also act opportunistically, for example, by uh, unreasonably delaying the negotiation or in some cases even refusing to accept what the court determined to be a friend royalty. Do you believe that it's important that the antitrust policy maintains a balanced approach that guards against opportunism, both on the side of patent holders and implementers? Um, if he, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll start with that one. Um, uh, absolutely, I, I, I had always, you know, Kind of taken the position, and uh, I think I've already said it today that opportunism can happen on either side of the bargaining table, um, and that um, contractual, you know, that for the most part these are contractual issues, and the regular contractual remedy should should be available. Particularly, again, going back to the issue of injunctions, um, based on what the what the policies of the standard setting organization were when the parties entered into the standard setting. Um, I, have, again, have big concerns about kind of antitrust coming in and changing the deal based on, you know, some, some concept of fairness. Um, I, I have mentioned, and I will mention again, if the party attained its market power by a deception on the standard set setting organization, if they said, you know, you know, fail to disclose, if there's a, a requirement to disclose IP rights, and they didn't disclose IP rights, and then they got market power because the standard was, um, was implemented. I think in that situation, antitrust may have a remedy there because it was a market power issue, right, where they obtained this market power in an illegitimate way. Um, but otherwise, I, I am very concerned about changing the agreed upon um, deal for the parties and also like even about pricing right whether it's you know small assailable unit or this or that i also think it's very important to, to go to you know what did the parties anticipate the pricing would be on right i have concerns about antitrust coming in and saying well oh we think they're you know using antitrust as a tool to say well no we want it we want the pricing um decision um to the Fran decision to be based on some other metric than what was you know, understood when the agreement was made and the, the IP was put into the screen. So, so I would just add that um, a, a, a balanced approach is incredibly important. And so the key question is, you know, what, what should the balance look like? And a core issue here, as Maureen articulated, is the debate between hold up and hold out. Hold up being when a patent holder uses market power to extract a large royalty from an implementer and hold out when an implementer refuses to engage in a licensing negotiation. 
and and as Maureen notes, obviously um, market power bestowed through a um, through a standard setting organization where the patent holder behaved in good faith, you know, unlike the facts alleged in Rambus and Unical, um, is market power that is legitimately derived. But both uh, both hold up and hold out can inhibit fruitful negotiations and can lead to litigation and both can deprive consumers of the substantial pro-competitive benefits of standardized technology. And so it is important to have a balanced approach that considers both possibilities. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of discussion about patent hold up. Advocates of an approach that's overly concerned with patent holdup would place the burden of proof on the patent holder to show the accused infringer is unwilling or unable to take a license on France terms. And this approach presumes patent holdup is frequent and harms competition and innovation. But economic literature recognizes the potential for both holdup and holdout. And the empirical literature doesn't support prioritizing patent holdup over holdout. And so um, let, me, let me just say, yes, a balanced approach is good. I wanna be clear, a balanced approach, as Maureen said, does not mean that antitrust law needs to be brought into the equation. The law should not incentivize either step holders or implementers to use hold up or hold out as a strategy. Much has been said about the risk of SEP hold up, but contract law and patent law are the correct vehicles for resolving those disputes. At the same time, step infringers must not be incentivized to use holdout as a strategy. Antitrust actions and the possibility of tribal damages will only serve to strengthen incentives to holdout. And so we need to be very careful not to set up the wrong incentives when we're thinking about the appropriate policies going forward. Thank you. Uh, let me now switch to a slightly different topic. Uh, large digital platforms such as Google and Amazon have been recently at the center of the antitrust debate. Some commentators have raised concerns with the size of these companies, with the market power they have accumulated. What is interesting for our discussion is that recent academic research has shown a historic version of large firms, including big tech, towards IP rights. And the rationale behind it, it's quite simple. So Professor Jonathan Burnett explains in his recent book that large companies that are vertically integrated or that are part of a conglomerate have other means than IP rights to monetize their inventions. They might, for example, practice their invention in a product and generate profit by selling this product. Alternatively, they might just give the um, a license to their IP rights for free, but then offer products and services in adjacent markets. In other words, these large companies, they do not necessarily need to rely on an IP system to monetize their investment in research and development. The situation is different for our small companies that are neither vertically integrated nor they participate in other markets. For them, IP rights are essential to monetize their investment. Consequently, from an economic perspective, a weak IP system basically raises the barriers to enter into the market for those companies and limits their ability to compete with the, in, with the incumbents. So in that sense, the attack on the IP system might be seen as part of a strategy to weaken competition and protect the position of incumbents. So my question is, what is your opinion about this issue? Do you believe that the strong IP system is important to foster competition? So I'll, I'll take the, the first crack at this one. Um, I believe a strong patent system is absolutely necessary to encourage innovation and increase consumer welfare and drive competition. I think Professor Barnett's large versus small dynamic regarding the importance of IP protection reminds me of the Arrow v. Schumpeter debate, or at least how the words of, of these thinkers have been twisted into new meanings over the years. Today, ARO supposedly stands for the proposition that highly disaggregated markets are always more innovative than concentrated ones. But ARO actually believes the incentive to innovate is weaker under monopolistic conditions 
and he categorized monopolic monopolistic conditions as those in which a firm enjoys significant barriers to entry and in which only a monopoly itself can invent. Schumpeter, for his part, did believe that big business drove innovation, but he also believed that the risk of creative destruction affected all firms and didn't believe his theories created a case against antitrust enforcement. So in reality, the beliefs of Arrow and Schumpeter aren't necessarily inconsistent with each other. And as with so many things, there are no easy answers. Economists um, cannot find a simple relationship between innovation and market structure. Uh, Professor Barnett's contribution is one in a, in a long history of contributions. When you take a look at the studies, what you see is that they are all over the map, finding that innovation is sometimes maximized by monopoly, other times by oligopoly, and yet other times by perfect competition. But to put it in more concrete terms, we cannot say small firms always and everywhere are more innovative than large ones, nor can we say deconcentrating a market now dominated by a few large firms will necessarily result in more innovation. And this conclusion actually has significant implications for those who cite innovation as a rationale for overhauling our antitrust laws. And I think we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So the, the bottom line, while studies on the relationship between innovation and market structure draw mixed conclusions, they actually have one pretty consistent finding. Our ability to predict the relationship between innovation and competition improves significantly if we add other variables like innovation level factors, industry level factors, and firm level factors. So the clear message is that when we're assessing innovation, we should conduct a holistic evaluation that is more closely tethered to the fact at hand. And, and I will underscore the importance of this issue. The potential impact to the US and the world economy is staggering. Economic literature shows us that innovation will, over the long run, deliver very large consumer welfare gains. Joe Broadley, who's written in this area, summarized the economic research as showing that innovation efficiency or technological process progress is the single most important factor in the growth of real output in the United States and the rest of the industrialized world. And so it follows that a strong patent system that incentivizes innovation is necessary for a strong economy, an important reminder as we seek to rebuild from COVID. Thank you, Commissioner Olhausen. Do you have any comments on this? Yes, um, so just uh, to add just a couple of money, the real issues at stake, they, they do, you know, innovation does bring huge gains, drive, drive our uh, economy, um, and employs a whole lot of people <laughs> in, in the U.S. In, in, the, in these industries, so it really couldn't, couldn't be a more crucial issue. But uh, just two, th two things to add on that. Um, so the... I mentioned a study that I did, which looked at, tried to find the correlation between the strength of IP rights um, and innovation as measured by investment in R&D. It's hard to do direct um, measure of innovation, but we thought investment in R&D could be a useful indicator at least. And it did find um, a, this strong correlation, but it was stronger in some industries than others. Uh, for example, in, in uh, pharma, in medical devices, and in, in some other areas, it was very key. And, and in, uh, in others, it played a lesser role. It's still important, but it played a lesser role. So I think the, uh, the different models you might see develop in different industries, that, that really makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I also want to go back to something that the FTC did. Um, when, when I first started at the commission, there was this huge uproar about patent assertion entities. Oh my gosh, patent assertion entities, they're terrible. They're doing all these things. They don't invent anything. And it really was, I think, this outgrowth of the idea that we do in the U.S. have um, a, and probably globally, but I'm more familiar with the U.S., have come to something of like a distributed um, invention model or innovation model, where you have entities that are you know, primarily interested in inventing but they don't necessarily want to then have the, you know, 
uh, to play the next step and um, implement and create, you know, manufacture the products and, and, all, and all of that. Um, and so by having the ability through strong IP rights to invent and then license uh, your product to, for other, or license your IP for others to create product um, helped really foster this model. But you did have this kind of concern that was somewhat overblown, I think, about um, you know, even President Obama saying, oh, these people, they don't create anything. They're just, you know, as if this was a negative thing. But so the FTC's PAE study, I think, was very, very useful in this debate because it looked at the fact that, uh, yeah, there were some um, basic, basically litigation model PAEs who had low quality patents. Uh, and who brought some a lot of lawsuits and then would settle for essentially slightly under what it, the discovery costs would be. But then you also had um, the licensing model of PAEs who had high quality patents, who got um, you know useful uh, you know they were useful inventions that entities were happy to license, uh, and that they got really the license the lion's share of the the licensing fees from these high quality patents. Uh, you know, versus all these low, low dollar settlements. Um, so I think one of the concerns I have is the idea that there's one model that's best, right? And I don't think there is one model that's best. I think we should have strong IP rights. We should let people, you know, contract in the way they think those IP rights will come to their, you know, highest value. And uh, that we shouldn't sort of be tilting the playing field through, through antitrust by saying, oh, well, you know, there, there's only one way. So kind of going back to your question about the big companies, um, if that's how they think it's, you know, most, um, you know, efficient for them to operate, I, th I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I have concerns then if they start to say, well, patents themselves aren't valuable, or, you know, all, all uh, patent assertion entities are patent trolls or something like that, because I don't think you can say, well, because this model works for you, big you know, player with the, these abilities. Therefore, other models are, are illegitimate. And I think we saw some of that tension around the patent assertion entity issue. Um, and I'm glad the FTC study helped bring some clarity to it. Thank you. So let us move now for a moment outside the domain of IP rights. Um, in the last year, there has been an intensive discussion questioning the need to revise antitrust law, uh, in particular triggered by these concerns with big tech. So following the issuance of the House report on competition in digital markets, several legislative proposals have been put forward, particularly in the last weeks. So if adopted, those proposed um, legislative reforms would bring important changes to US antitrust law, affecting not only big tech, but virtually every single market participant. So what is your view on those suggestions? So I'm, I'm happy to, to kick this one off. Um, in keeping with the theme of today's discussions, I want to caution policymakers not to harm innovation in their attempts to punish big tech. There's a lot of discontent with big tech. I think there are at least three strains of concerns. Uh, the first is Section 230 issues. The second is privacy. And the third uh, falls within the antitrust bucket. And I would, I would caution against using antitrust as a solution for all of those concerns and in the end, uh, essentially punishing innovation. Um, there are many bills in both houses of Congress. I think uh, there may be more that get introduced in the near future and, and time is short, so we can't discuss all of my concerns today, but I will share some of the biggest concerns uh, that I have regarding the various pieces of legislation that have been proposed. First, some of the bills don't target companies with market power. Instead, they focus on size. And so uh, if you take this approach, you may prohibit some large companies from competing against other companies that fail to meet the specified size threshold, but that actually may have market power. And this industrial engineering may end up preventing robust competition that can challenge the positions of entrenched incumbents. Uh, my belief is that we should encourage more competition from all rivals and potential new entrants. 
uh, second uh, strain of concerns, many proposals are untethered from any competitive effects. Instead of analyzing conduct under the rule of reason, some of the bills would place bright line rules on certain companies and certain sectors of the economy. Maureen talked about tilting the playing field. Um, and, and I think that having special rules for special sectors of the economy does that. But I also think it is, um, it is very bad policy to depart from a, a thorough analysis of anti-competitive effects and instead to start applying bright line rules as we did decades ago. Third, many of the proposed bills ignore the consumer welfare standard in favor of essentially a competitor first approach. This approach favors inefficient rivals over the low prices and increased innovation that benefits consumers. I am strongly in favor of maintaining the consumer welfare standard. Fourth, some of the proposals shift the burden of proof for conduct that's likely to be pro-competitive in many instances. And this shifting defies our general understanding of due process, for one, and it also encourages nuisance suits that are difficult difficult to dismiss. And the civil penalties uh, that are being contemplated are, are huge in many of these proposals, which further uh, will encourage baseless suits. And so taken together, these proposals are great for lawyers who are looking to collect legal fees, but terrible for the economy. And then one final note, at least one proposal mandates that companies take certain actions to facilitate interoperability and third part party accessibility, including APIs. These proposals raise a lot of concerns, among them data security concerns, as companies will need to balance security with legally mandated access to third parties. Uh, further, the FTC is given broad power to, to make the standards that companies uh, must adopt and, and approve changes with little to no oversight. Um, the, the FTC is capable of enforcing the antitrust laws, not designing interoperability and accessibility systems. I think uh, you know this is essentially akin to asking the EPA to build the Artemis lunar lander that will return people to the moon. Um, and then finally, I think there is um, throughout a lot of these proposals just a, a general disdain for investment in innovation. There is a desire to revive the essential facilities doctrine to breathe new life into it. And I think that if, if competitors know that they are going to be required to share their inventions, creations, and platforms with rivals, uh, that is going to significantly diminish the incentives that they have to create those in the first place. And so I think it all goes back to this uh, static versus dynamic perspective, this instant gratification versus delayed gratification. Our founders were correct when they established the patent system, recognizing that delayed gratification, in other words, uh, awarding patent rights and prolonging competition is in fact the best way over the long run to enhance consumer welfare for our country. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Olhausen, what is your view on those proposals? Well, first of all, um, I will just uh, embrace uh, <laughs> and second everything that Commissioner Wilson said. Uh, she really, very uh, accurately and succinctly identified many of the the, the problems with with these with these bills, which are one of the, the factors. It's very much competitor focused. So, in addition to the issues uh, that she has identified and the problems that this will create for investment and for innovation and for data security and privacy and a whole host of, of other issues where all these requirements of uh, you know, inter, interoperability and interconnecting and sharing data and giving the, um, the platforms, essentially putting it on them to say, well, if you made the decision wrong, um, you, you know, essentially you have to prove by clear and convincing evidence that this, you know, this was necessary. And if you get it wrong, you could be subject to these enormous penalties. One of the issues that I think is lurking beneath this, which is, is I, I think really needs further discussion, is we operate in a global economy, right? So these bills focus on, you know, essentially that's based. You know, theoretically, there might be a few, few others, but essentially they're, they're focused on the, the companies who are examined by the House Judiciary Committee, so Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. 
Um, and they create these opportunities for foreign-based competitors, as well as US-based, but let's also think about foreign instrumentalities, state-owned enterprises, who will be able, uh, there are private rights of action in some of these bills, that they will be able to come in and say, you know, um, file all kinds of nuisance lawsuits and, um, you know, pro-competitive um, acquisitions where they are, will not be subject to these same kinds of restrictions that we're putting on some of the most innovative companies in the world. You know, can they step over the bounds and sometimes, you know, engage in any competitive, um, you know, behavior or violate consumer protection laws? Absolutely. I'm not saying anyone should get a free pass. But we have, we are tilting, if these bills are enacted, we are tilting the playing field uh, that uh, in a way that I think is going to enable global players to start to um, out innovate American uh, companies because these bills are going to hobble them so severely by being able to continue to invest, to um, acquire, you know, innovative things to, to, even if they build in-house, to move into other um, areas. And it also, one other thing that I want to mention is, and Commissioner Wilson, I, I think, touched on this, it also prevents their ability to reposition to compete with each other, right? And I think oftentimes we're going to see who can enter at scale, who can really, you know, bring in a, a challenge in a market where, um, you know, maybe someone has a strong share. It's probably another big player. And why would we disable them from being able to do that? I don't think that that serves competition or consumers uh, very well. So I, I concern that uh, if they are inactive, will bring um, could be very serious for um, continued American innovation. Thank you. And maybe for the end, let me just go back to our main topic, which is the um, interplay between antitrust and IP. So at the recent conference, the acting head of the antitrust division of the US Department of Justice said that the agency is rethinking the approach towards IP rights. He said that a balanced view of the intersection between IP and antitrust law is in the process of being developed. So do you think that the current approach is out of balance and what type of provisions do you think would be welcomed, if any? So maybe, maybe I'll just uh, kind of uh, end where I started, which if they are looking for a balanced approach, look to the antitrust guidelines for the licensing of intellectual property rights that came out um, January of 2017. Of 2017. I think that, and it represents a lot of um, knowledge and continuity over, over the years. So I learned that because I think that that does represent a very balanced um, approach to these issues. Thank you, Commissioner Wilson. So uh, I, as we have been discussing throughout our time together, a balanced view is important. I think uh, as we strive to achieve balance, I, policy decisions need to be both procedurally and substantively wise. And I think procedurally an inconsistent approach fails to provide clear guidance. I am concerned about the DOJ's recent actions uh, in terms of switching policy positions uh, with incoming administrations. DOJ recently reclassified the business review letter evaluating the IEEE's patent policy that was issued in 2020 under the Trump administration. And this action effectively removed recent amendments to a 2015 letter from the Obama administration. And commentators are worried that a 2019 statement. Uh, it's a, a joint DOJ PTO statement on remedies for SEPs subject to FRAN commitments will face that same fate in favor of an earlier 2013 statement. 
So it is important to get policy correct, but my concern is that all too often political forces prevail over sound economic and legal analysis, which creates a world where antitrust and IP policies are changing with each new administration. And the, the flip-flopping inhibits clarity and predictability, and it makes it difficult for businesses to operate and innovate within the boundaries of antitrust and IP law. Um, I, I'm also concerned substantively. As, as I mentioned before, policymakers are uh, exhibiting an increasing disdain for business conduct that incentivizes innovation. We talked about uh, attempts to revitalize the essential facilities doctrine. Um, and, and, and I think that move threatens to treat success and innovation as an antitrust violation which, um, which poses a significant concern for innovation and, and growth in, in our economy. And so um, again, I, um, I would urge us to, to take a balanced approach by, uh, by remembering that a static snapshot doesn't take into account dynamic efficiencies uh, and reminding us what we learned in, in kindergarten and elementary school, which is that instant gratification may be satisfying for a moment, but delayed gratification is, is much more useful over the long run. And so I think as we, as we think about wise IP policy and where we should head in the future, getting that balance right is incredibly important for consumers and for our economy, particularly as we are rebuilding post-COVID. Thank you. Well, with that, we have come to the end of our event. I would like to thank our speakers for this fascinating discussion and a very important one. I have really enjoyed it and I will hope I will have the opportunity to host you again soon. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here.